A play rehearsed by trainee educators and carers to mark the bicentenary of the birth of theologian and social reformer Johann Himmrich Wischern. The aim is to highlight social evils in Germany. In the past, they were even more extreme. Indeed, 175 years ago, they prompted Wischern to set up what he called rescue homes for neglected and difficult adolescents. In the mid-19th century, Vision developed an educational theory according to which children should not be beaten or locked away, but treated above all as free individuals, an ethical principle that has been the cornerstone of educational science in Germany ever since. One day, these students will work for the state social services or for one of the independent welfare associations like the Diaconia, the social service organization of the Lutheran Church perhaps in one of the many institutions of the Protestant St. John's Foundation, which Vision established in Berlin in 1858. Trainee church social worker Azu Oidal plays an unwelcome foreigner. What does she know about Vision? That he helped the poor and needy, especially children. We too should help such people, get them off the streets where there is poverty, and cater for their needs. Und ihm Hilfe leisten, ihm dienen. Moved by the mass poverty he saw, in the revolutionary year of 1848, Vision gave a speech that was well received in Protestant circles. It led to the establishment of the Inner Mission, from which the present day Diaconio developed. From the head of the St. John's Foundation, we learn that Vision's spirit is still omnipresent here. I hope that you stumble across Vision wherever you go, wherever a part of his story can be traced. The main thing, though, is that hopefully you will find some of Vision's legacy in our staff, reflected in the loving way they treat the people they are working with. For 27-year-old Hanadi, remedial teacher Lars Madel plays an important role as someone she can relate to. Hanadi is disabled and Lars helps her with everyday tasks. In doing so, he enables Hanadi to contribute to communal life in the hostel. Hanadi has difficulty performing even simple household tasks, but every time she's successful, it represents a major triumph, and Lars praises her. A hostel for the mentally challenged offers a home in the form of four residential groups. These groups are not families in the conventional sense, but communal living arrangements comprised of people with totally different characteristics, different talents and limitations. We support life here in all its many facets. Like everyone here, Hanadi has her own room. Vision's basic concept of creating family conditions has been systematically developed further through the concept of a private sphere. The jointly compiled schedule helps Hanadi to maintain an overview of her routine for the day and the week. 
So she knows that on Sunday morning she goes to church and then has the afternoon free. Today, she says, she's going cycling with Lars. Hanadi also reckons she's got gymnastics, but Lars tells her that this time it's been cancelled. The two regularly cycle to the place where empties can be returned. When working with people with disabilities, you have to take over a lot of tasks yourself. You have to give them your support in every sense of the word. It's important not to make excessive demands. Hanadi should be encouraged to do as much as possible herself, but without being overtaxed. The St. John's Foundation also places great emphasis on behavior on the roads. A bike trip is a challenge for Hanadi every time, yet it's always one of the highlights of her weekly schedule. <laughs> It's said that every person is capable of developing and learning their entire life long. That applies to those who live here and to those who work here. Hanadi knows which color of bottle goes in which container. Hanadi and Lars's joint program for the day is coming to an end. A carer can now devote his time to his own interests. In my spare time, I'm also training to become an actor. I try not to plan my life too rigidly. Instead, I let myself be influenced and see what really grabs me. The Diaconia Theatre Group is rehearsing scenes from Vishan's life for the big performance in his bicentennial year. Ich will hier raus. Ich schaffe es nicht. Ich will hier raus. Es nicht. Ja! A key scene shows Vishan as someone in inner turmoil. He'd like nothing more than to solve all problems at once, help the poor, strengthen the fraternity, be there for his Amanda and their children, deepen people's faith and at the same time introduce a prison reform. And Vishan really did set many things in motion. In a major speech held in this building in Berlin 150 years ago, he convinced wealthy citizens and influential politicians to build a brother's house, which later became the St. John's Foundation. Today, prominent figures in German society are arriving to honor Vision's work, including Richard von Weizsäcker, Germany's former president. <laughs> In this historic place, Vishan's speech, so momentous at the time, is reenacted. Ladies and gentlemen, trusting in God from whom alone comes all mercy and blessing, I accept the permission to address you. Vishan explains to his audience that diaconia means providing help motivated by Christian beliefs. Using the same arguments as in his speech of 1848, he appeals to the precept of brotherly love and pillories social need and its ethical consequences. He was even able to convince skeptics, like those on the stage here. The St. John's Foundation was built and became a model. Vision's inner mission continues to grow with numerous bodies forming throughout Germany. Protestant associations are being set up along with institutions for nursing the sick, educating children and providing pastoral care. Whatever else I might be able to offer, I have not drawn from within myself, but received from God's merciful hand. Today, it's almost impossible to imagine what living conditions were like for most people in Vision's day. Lying under rags in the corner, 
was a 73-year-old man. He was so terribly ill from a chest disease that he could scarcely speak. Lacking linen or a pillow, he was an appalling picture of heart-rending misery. There was also a woman, a tall girl and two boys, pale figures with no underclothes, shivering with cold and hunger. These people just had to be rescued and helped no matter what. But how? The teacher who experienced this was Johann Hinrich Wieschen. He was born 200 years ago, the oldest of seven children. His childhood ended overnight when his father died suddenly of consumption. At the time, nobody had any idea that the Rauers House, which he founded later in the Hamburg suburb of Horn, would be the starting base for a movement that shook the entire Protestant church. To modern day ears, the word rescue perhaps has too much pathos to it, but Vishen knew precisely what it means. He was just turned 25 when he founded the Rauers House, a hostel for poor and neglected children in a small farm building he'd been given near Hamburg. He helped with active brotherly love. He provided the children with a home, gave them food, taught them to read and write, and ensured that they learnt craftsman skills. He offered them a life with the security of a family. For Wieschen, rescuing someone meant making them happy. Rescuing the unfortunate and making them happy is one of the fundamental concepts of diaconics. Even though today's social problems are different from those in Vision's day, the basic principle of diaconics has changed little. Even King William Frederick IV of Prussia was fired by Vision's concept of inner mission, of free diaconics. In 1835, he had Karl Friedrich Schinkel design St. Elizabeth's, a church with a vicarage and a diaconic house in a social hotspot. It was at this very place on February the 1st, 2008, that the Protestant Church's diaconic organization held its annual reception. To mark the opening of Vision Year, German Chancellor Angela Merkel gave a speech. Johann Henrich Wichern, as theologe, social reformer. As a theologian and social reformer, Johann Henrich Wichern brought the church closer to people. His guiding principle was that of brotherly love. He wanted to convince, not castigate. He rejected corporal punishment, in those days undoubtedly a modern approach. He focused on dialogue with young people. The events of the past week were examined and discussed every Sunday. This was unusual for the time, but Vision was successful. Modern educational theory still draws on this approach today. When we celebrate Vision's life today, we recognize him as a dedicated pioneer of social work and uphold his call for greater social commitment. To mark the bicentenary of his birth, the Protestant Church held a competition in which entrants had to submit their design of a monument in Vision's honor. Potsdam sculptor Karl Konstantin Weber didn't exactly reinvent the wheel, but he did win the competition with a surprising concept. A round form is created. Is it a wheel, perhaps? Children are turning it. The final shape emerged from many drafts. This is how children play with a large cheese or millstone. But I don't see millstone as a negative word because these children are rolling it like a toy. And they're showing one another the numbers on it. So even though they're of different ages, they're learning and helping one another. Vishen ensured that his charges set out on their path through life able to read and write and with craftsman skills. So these are Vishen's children, exactly, I believe, as he would have chosen them to be. I don't think that Vishen, who refused to give up running the Rauer's house, would have wanted a monument to himself there. 
He saw the children as the focal point. A life-size replica of the sculpture will be erected in front of the Rauer's house in Hamburg. The work is called for the children of the street. For me, it will be the nucleus of the entire Rauer's house site. This model of the park shows that all paths will lead to it. It's always visible as a silhouette. From this direction, the statue is slightly at an angle to give it space. And from this direction, visitors encounter the wall with the sculpture facing the Rauer's house. The Rauer's House Protestant Foundation is one of the biggest and best-known diaconic institutions in Germany. The Brother and Sisterhood has 650 members. They help and care for more than 1,200 disabled persons, as well as the elderly, children and adolescents. In addition, 1,600 pupils attend the Vishon School on the site. 150 trainees visit the Vocational School for Geriatric Care, and 250 students attend the Protestant College for Social Work and Diaconics. And it all began with a single house. This was Johann Hinrich Wieschen's first apartment in the old Rauer's house. Together with his mother and a sister, he moved in here in 1833. The first of the children he cared for lived under the roof and slept on bundles of straw. For the first time, the children experienced a community in which they could feel at ease. For them, the Sunday service was a minor celebration. The care we provide here is centered to a large extent on helping the children to discover their own capabilities and, through training, enabling them to lead independent lives. In this house, adolescents live in a commune. Scarcely one of them arrived here voluntarily. They'd all found themselves in adverse social conditions. Their parents couldn't cope with the responsibility of bringing them up properly. As a result, the youngsters went off the rails. Before being brought here, most of them had attracted the attention of the police and the majority had actually committed crimes. Here, they learned to integrate into normal, everyday life again. At one time, 18-year-old Pascal often got into trouble. At home, he says, there was a lot of aggro. But within the framework of a commune project at the Rauer's house, he learned to reorientate himself. He left the hostel three years ago and today lives with his mother again. But he's never lost contact with the project. Now this former delinquent comes here to support other adolescents who are still part of the project. To be exact, he helps them with their schooling. You. Where learning English is concerned, the boys have a lot of ground to make up, and they'd much rather be taught by an ex-resident than by a real teacher. In the past, the majority of them didn't really like school. Often, they didn't even bother attending. <laughs> Fourteen-year-old Chris has been living in the commune for a year now. He'd like one day to become a computer specialist. That's why he's so keen on learning English. Chris receives support from Pascal and from teacher Manfred Seiler, who are helping him find a good traineeship. I also rang up a computer service firm and was told, yes, they take on a trainee, but the boss himself wasn't in, so I'm waiting for a call back for confirmation. Manfred Seiler is happy with developments. A couple of other applications have been made and the computer firm looks promising. Mm -hmm. Bettina has the room next to Chris's. They help each other and not only with computer problems. Bettina is having trouble finding a certain website, but 
With expert help from her neighbour, she finally succeeds. We in the team assume that every adolescent here knows intrinsically what's best for him or herself, that they are all in a position to realise their dreams, to pursue a certain path, to grow in stature and develop. Bettina has spent nearly a year here. Her big hobby is collecting mangas. Manga is the Japanese word for comics and, besides having a real collection of books and magazines full of fantasy characters, Bettina also draws and paints her own figures. Bettina's enthusiasm for mangas is linked to her fondness for the goth scene, characterised by goth rock and a fascination with death and the transitoriness of life. Its adherents purposely stand out, for example, by wearing black clothing. Where her outfit is concerned, Bettina also draws on her manga figures for inspiration. I lived with my father for a year. Unfortunately, things somehow got rather out of hand. I learned about the goth scene after I'd moved in with my father. So, I've not been a part of it for all that long. That's also when I met my former boyfriend, not the one I'm with now. My parents just couldn't get on with him, and I must say that through him and through the scene in general, I screwed up a lot. I used to do a bunk at night. Back then I was a suicide risk, a really extreme case. The Commune group helped Bettina find her feet again and come a lot closer to her dream of a better life. Every month we meet with our carers for what we call a resources discussion. We talk about all the things we have a problem with what we'd like to change and what we'd like to continue with. When I was still with my former boyfriend, I was out and about with him so often that I was given a weekly schedule. It stipulated the exact times when I had to be back here. And the way the timetable was laid out was a real pain. I can tell you that. But now I've settled down and simply got used to the situation. In fact, these days, I don't even need to check my schedule anymore. Things are going great. Things are going great for Pascal, too. That wasn't the case at first when he and his brothers and sisters had to be taken out of their parents' care and put in a home. At first, things were really tough. I got into arguments and fights. I found everything unfair, even where the supervisors were concerned. But in time, you get used to the new situation, and you also establish a relationship with the supervisors. The ones I had were really good people. Pascal felt respected here. He was given support and, as with Bettina, the strict rules in the hostel produced astonishing results. Today he comes here voluntarily and earns money by giving private lessons. Pascal plans to take his school leaving examination. I did a lot of bad things. Now I don't even have the time to. I play soccer three times a week. I give private lessons at least twice a week. I watch National League soccer matches. And in addition, I go to school. I don't know where I'd find the time to screw up. The youngsters appreciate the personal atmosphere in the hostel just as much as they enjoy coming together around the huge kitchen table, where matters important and trivial, as well as dreams, are discussed openly. My big aim is to teach art at a college. I want to move away from the Hamburg area, 50 or 60 kilometers away, preferably to my brother who lives on the Baltic. If I stood on the balcony, I could kick a ball into the sea. Today, Vishen would gaze with pride on the legacy of his grand idea of a rescue home. On the old site and in the big city, his work is being continued in a wide variety of ways. In the end, Vision's tireless social commitment drained him. Even though he had suffered several strokes, he was unwilling to hand over the reins. 
but his lingering illness finally prevailed. In 1881, Johann Hinrich Wischern died in Hamburg, aged 72. Dietrich Zattler is his ninth successor. Wischern taught us to think in terms of small units. No facility of the present-day Rauer's house has the character of a home. We don't have any big buildings. The people we look after are always housed in units of manageable size, so that the individual is supported by the community, and also that the individual helps shape the community. So everything we do for the people in our care remains perfectly clear. Were Vishan to look out of the window today, he'd be happy.